Hello there, I'm K-Ball and welcome to Human Skills, where I interview tech industry leaders about all the non-technical skills that go into success in the tech industry. I first had the pleasure of working with Chris John Peterson in 2008, when he was already a wickedly productive software engineer. Since then, he moved his way up the ladder, becoming a manager, then a director, then temporarily head of engineering at Apartment List. He quickly learned that he did not like that and has been working as a staff engineer ever since. He is an incredibly clear thinker with a very fast and clever wit. And in this conversation, he managed to boil down almost all of engineering and product development to a single tool, checklists. With the core tool of checklists and the core goal of systematically destroying ambiguity, we spanned an incredible range of important topics of personal and team productivity, deadlines, and more. Please enjoy this conversation with Chris John Peterson. Chris John, welcome to the show. Gavin, thank you. Hello. Hello. I am excited to get to talk to you in this venue. I always have fun when we have our conversations. Um, so let's get started with having you share a little bit about you. So do you want to take us through kind of your background and how you came to care about this thing that I've been calling human skills? Sure. Um, yeah, my background is, uh, I'm Christian. I've been a programmer for some years, 17, 18, professionally. Um, did CS at college, joined startups. I've been tooling around the Bay Area. Um, I'm currently at uh, Slack slash Salesforce, um, a bunch of startups before that. Um, and I care about human skills because I want to build stuff, and it takes skills to do that. <laughs> uh, and it, uh, you know, over the years, I've developed a variety of opinions about those skills. Yes. Well, and that's that's actually one of the things that I think is going to be fun about this is I think you you have strong opinions about a number of different things. So let's maybe start with um, kind of the skills that it takes to be productive as an engineer beyond just writing code. So when you think about, oh, you need those human skills to be to build stuff, what do you mean? So the, yeah, like the, the, the writing code is, is uh, a smaller and smaller part of what you do as you get more senior. Um, I'm sure the senior people can attest um, and the junior people hopefully are not too surprised by. Um, but even so, like the, um, you know, unless you're a solo shop, uh, just coding, uh, you know, at your own desk in your own room, uh, all by yourself all the time, then like you're going to be talking to other humans, right? You're doing stuff together. Um, and that's a lot of the point and a lot of the fun. Um, so outside of programming, like there, there are plenty of ways to be more effective by yourself when you're programming um, around like how you approach stuff and motivation. Um, but there are lots of those ways that need to translate into like what are the other people are doing nearby you um, and things like that. Well, let's start with the individual uh, because I talk about human skills and everybody immediately jumps to, okay, let's talk about talking to people, which is really important, but we ourselves are <laughs> human as well. Like, have you developed a set of practices that you use to, to keep yourself motivated and productive? Um, I mean, step one is care about what you're building, right? Um, like that's, that's the easiest thing. Like if you, if you give a shit, uh, let me know if I shouldn't swear, but uh, you know, if, uh, if capital G capital S you give a shit, um, then you're going to be motivated. Um, so that's step one. Um, outside of that, like, uh, you know, there, there are, even if the project is dull or if, uh, it's the same thing that you've done before a thousand times, like, okay, see if you can speed run it, right? Like, like there are ways, um, or see if you can, uh, can learn something while you do it, try building it in a new way. Right. Um, and there's the danger there of becoming like the magbiter developer who's always like playing with a new JavaScript framework, um, given that there's so many to choose from. Um, but, seen. <laughs> right. Yeah, you're responsible for some percentage <laughs> that, I, that I don't need to bring up. Um, or like, uh, and especially on a team, especially as you get more senior and there are junior people around or even senior people who haven't done that thing, um, then the game can be teach them to do it, right? Um, and then they get to learn. They're excited about learning. Uh, you maybe are excited about teaching or at least that can be rewarding. Um, and then you free up your time to go do something else that is, uh, is more interesting than whatever the task has become. I like the way you framed that of kind of finding the game in something. Um, it's like personal gamification. Do you have mm -hmm. things that you have gamified for yourself? Um, yes, in that everybody loves a checklist. Um, and so that like that that's a that's a productivity thing that is good for me and good for the people that I have to foist tasks upon. <laughs> um, is like like you know you love checking the box you love the dopamine hit um you love like hey we're getting closer to having zero things left to do um 
And like, you know, if you've, assuming you're not a project manager and like just derive innate joy from burn down charts, like you do probably derive joy from launching the thing or being done with the thing, right? Or like having accomplished it. Um, plus, I mean, and I, th I think in checklists, um, like people will write paragraphs and paragraphs of test, text uh, that I will write in bullet points instead. Um, but like having wh whatever form the list takes, having the list brings like clarity to everybody, to yourself and everybody around you. Um, and this actually, I, I was thinking about this in the, in the shower this morning. Um, of like, like, what should I maybe bring up with Kevin? Like, I, I think it's um, ambiguity that destroys velocity almost faster than anything else. Um, of like, what are we going to build? Or how are we supposed to build this? Or was it supposed to be A or B? Or why did we make this decision? Um, so having the checklist of like, this is the thing, uh, it, it is a very, very cheap way to eliminate most of the ambiguity. Um, and then everybody feels good because they're like chugging along at top speed instead of uh, kind of thrashing between tasks to figure out what's happening. I really like that framing. Um, I think as you move up, more and more of your job becomes, how do I take something that is ambiguous and create clarity out of it? Totally. So, uh, beyond... yeah, the, uh, oh, go ahead. Um, well, the, the, that um, I think we've talked about this before, but that makes me think of the, um, like, if you remember the five, uh, the five question words from second grade or whenever, right? Who, what, why, where, when? Um, yeah. I, to, to, to oversimplify career paths, I feel like we move through those um, where you're fresh out of college or boot camp or self-taught, like wherever you, wherever you come from, this is your first job job. Um, and you need to be told what to do, right? Go to this part of the code, change it to do this thing, right? Here's your ticket. Like, let me know if you have questions. Um, but then you, you get more advanced and you know more, if not about like stuff in general, about the local system at least. Um, and then somebody, or actually, sorry, sorry, I started wrong. That's how you need to be told how to do the thing. Um, eventually you graduate to what to do. Hey, go do the thing. You know how you can figure it out. Um, and then eventually you graduate to why are we doing the thing? And that's where it's super ambiguous, right? The customer needs this, right? Our client needs this. The users need this, right? Why do we have this need? Um, and then you get to figure out what, and you get to delegate now to the other people, like how, um, so I, I see kind of the, the ontology there. Um, in in tackling that ambiguity and like kind of expanding your your uh, abstractness and your blast radius. Does it keep going? Can we move up to who? Uh, yes, but I got out of management for a reason. <laughs> 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 so I don't know if I'm the guy for who. Yes, at some point you need to be picking the team, right? That is figuring out the why and all that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, that was uh, that it turned out was not something that I particularly enjoyed. I might have been good at it in certain situations and maybe not in others. Um, but I'm, uh, yeah, I'm not your who guy. I'm your, uh, I'm your why to what to how guy. I love that. Well, let's, let's ask a little bit of that question. Why did you get out of management? What were the things that you noticed that cued you in that maybe this was not for you? Um, a bunch of it is it was too far away from, from building. Um, right. Like, you know, if you look at archetypes of people, there are, uh, like builders and different kinds of builders and organizers and, you know, tr like troop leaders and like all that kind of thing. Um, so I was, um, I, I enjoyed management from the, uh, more from the tech lead perspective. Like I started with a small team of two other people, like they were both college grads. Um, and I was doing the tech specs and I was coding with them. Um, and as soon as I had like four people reporting to me, suddenly like all the coding time was gone. It just fell off a cliff. There was no linear decline. <laughs> um, and, but it was still like kind of fun, um, cause it was still a lot of like mentoring and teaching and still code reviewing and like that kind of thing. Um, then I got my first manager report and that was still kind of fun, even in sort of a relaxing way of like, I understand that your report has this like personal problem and I have plenty of advice, but it's all easy when it's advice and it's much harder to actually go speak with them about it. Um, I'm full of advice. I just don't know if it's any good. <laughs> um, and so, so that was still fine. But once I got, so once our second VP left and I became briefly the head of engineering, I was doing zero of these things. I was talking about the annual budget and headcount needs and how the team should be organized. And like, I, and I, I just didn't care. Um, right. Like you, and, and my, uh, one of those VPs had a lot of fun aphorisms. He said, um, you have more of the responsibility and less of the control. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, yeah, it, it became, it, it wasn't the fun thing that I got into to computers for. Um, it wasn't making a thing exist that didn't existing before. Um, and I figured out, oh, I can do all, all this mentorship that I do enjoy and all this teaching that I really enjoy. I've been teaching for 30 years, um, without having the, the HR 
needs, <laughs> right? Like without with having to deal with the budget or the performance problems or, uh, you know, whatever else people have going on in their lives. Totally. All right. So coming back to clarity and ambiguity, we hmm. talked about one tool for creating clarity, which was the checklist. Are there other tactics that you use to try to move from ambiguity to clarity or from the why to the what? Um, the checklist is 95% of my tools. <laughs> um, it's, you know, because somebody, somebody says, hey, how is this thing? And the answer is this way, this way, and that way, right? Or, hey, how are we going to do this thing? And the answer is ABC. Um, the, you know, that the, you do at times need to elaborate. <laughs> um, and so that gets more into the, the, um, the one-to-many communication on, like, how the project is going to go down or has gone down um, or maybe is currently going down or, in, in better cases, up. Um, there's a there's a, a book that I should read called The Checklist Manifesto by the Surgeon General. I forget his name. He's a doctor. Um, I think a surgeon where checklists are important, um, right? In the same way that they're important for airplanes. I should probably read this book given my love of checklists. Um, but I, I also kind of assume that I know what's inside. I, I should probably verify that. Um, so the the other thing is um, like a, in in non checklist formats, um, the heuristic that I try to employ whether it's a ticket or a tech spec or a project one page or whatever, uh, the heuristic I try for is if I close my eyes for some substantial amount of time, right? If I go chill on a beach for a bit and then I come back, has what happened been substantially similar to what I thought was gonna happen? Um, and how can I write this document or whatever it is in such a way that that is likely to happen? Um, so, you know, in, in a ticket that means uh, a clear acceptance criteria, however you want to do your tickets and in whatever, uh, you know, ticket tracking system you're using, uh, whether it's a checklist in a VIM file or like JIRA, um, you know, write down, this is what we need to do. If you know anything about where to do it, give them pointers. You don't have, they don't have to start from scratch, whoever picks it up. Um, and then acceptance criteria, right? Uh, I've been in so many retrospectives where the team was like, we need better acceptance criteria. And then a month later, we need better acceptance criteria. It's like, okay, what happened? Like, all you had to do was write it. Um, uh, we actually, actually was giving you another idea. Um, so uh, that works in tickets, that works in tech specs, right? Like, here's what I know, here's what we still need to find out, here's given what I know is how I think we should go about this. Um, and very importantly in there, um, because I mentioned before, like, wait, why are we doing this again? Um, not from the not from the what is the purpose of this project perspective, but from the why did we choose this way perspective. Um, write down the ways you didn't choose, for God's sake. Um, because otherwise, you're going to run into every, every every approach has a problem, and as soon as somebody runs into the problem, they're going to say, "Oh, why, why didn't we do it the other way?" If you write down why you didn't do it the other way, they'll look at it and be like, "Oh, right, right, yeah, it sounded worse the other way," and they can move on. Otherwise, the same conversation happens again. Yes. Oh my gosh, this I feel like this has come up in so many situations where documenting the decisions and mm -hmm. part of that is not just what we chose, but why we didn't choose these other things. Mm -hmm. And and one other piece that sometimes comes up is what might make us want to revisit this decision. Totally. But um, mm -hmm. like, <laughs> I feel like the problem of not having done that comes up in all with almost everyone I talk to. Yep, <laughs> it really does. Um, yeah, the, um, the the VP with all the aphorisms, he saw this as kind of the um, like the practice before the game. Um, right, like you run your drills, you run your um, your plays, you run like whatever the techniques are to accomplish your game. Um, and that way, if you need to like call an audible or change course, everybody has the grounding in the whole discussion before, right? We considered A, B, and C. We chose A because of this. We didn't choose B and C because of this. And if you get halfway through and you're like, oh, that underlying evidence is different than we expected, we should switch to B. Everyone's like, yep, got it, right? Instead of having to just boot everybody again. I love that. Okay, so I want to dive a little deeper on a couple of these things. So first, acceptance criteria. How do you, you, you mentioned that often it'll come up, we need better acceptance criteria and nothing happens. And I think the reason nothing happens is that there's a gap between we want good acceptance criteria and here is what you do to write good acceptance criteria. Mm -hmm. What in your mind goes into writing useful acceptance criteria? Um. I feel like, like to, to sort of put it in one sentence, it should be a clear statement of the thing that happens when, right? Like when, when, I, when I load this page and I click this button and I enter this data and I click this other button, this is the result, 
Um, there are a bunch of stuff, a bunch of things implied in that of like, I didn't find any errors along the way, right? Like those are obvious people will find those. Um, but you need like ju just a, ju just that simple statement of the desired fact um, is clear and every, everybody can uh, infer like what needs to happen to get there. Um, right, like, like sort of, you know, uh, like people use phrases like outcome-driven development or like whatever the thing is, right? Here's the outcome. I try this and this happens. Whether you're like front end or back end or wherever, it's going to sort of change maybe what that means. Um, I am nearly 100% back end, so my acceptance criteria is the case analysis resident in the unit tests, right? Like you had these inputs, they had these ranges they could all cover. And so you've picked interesting cases from each and in all their combinations, and you've proved to me in a test that that is what happens. So from the back end, I feel like the unit test is the acceptance criteria, right? And the, the, the case analysis, like when you're writing a ticket, you don't want to be doing that. That's the job of the person building it to think through. Um, but they need at least enough to go on of like, you know, when, when, when somebody in the UI clicks this, this thing happens. Okay, that boils down to this back end function. Here are my domains and ranges, and then I've walked through all the possibilities. Um, like that, that's what kind of the one sentence in the ticket needs to be sort of like like drilled down in detail, but also be interpreted by the implementer. Um, but if you're a front end person, it's going to be your playwright tests um, or your manual clicking, God forbid, um, or whatever, right? Like it's going to mean a different thing in a different place. Um, but hopefully, you have people on the team or can train people on your team to give them the one sentence description, or not description, like the one sentence outcome, um, figure out the interstitial pieces. And if you can't write that sentence, you probably need to make more than one ticket. Well, that comes to another piece of this, which is, <clears throat> excuse me, um, degree of abstraction, mm -hmm. right? You may write acceptance criteria at the level of a ticket, but you can also write it potentially at the level of a project or other things. So how do you kind of translate that down or break that out? Boy, that's a very good question. Um, well, because it does get like more and more abstract as you go, I guess, earlier in the project, right from the project spec to the tech spec, et cetera. Um, whatever happens before the project spec, I, I don't know. I, I assume they all spring forth from Zeus's head. Um, the, I mean, so pr presumably there's a business need for this thing. Um, or if your business is not put together yet, a, a product desire, right? Which is fine. Um, like you, you are building the thing that does whatever and you need a widget to accomplish a subtask. And so like getting everybody on the same page as far as what that subtask entails is sort of the acceptance criteria, like up the project spec, right? As this user, user persona, I need to be able to invite a friend to my Slack channel um, or turn on and off what things are available on my team or, um, you know, uh, test their video and audio before they join the Riverside chat. Um, and then that needs to get translated through the tech spec and through the tickets and into the code at like the varying levels of the acceptance criteria. So this project succeeds if a user can test their video and if our, you know, metric for was their video broken during the call drops to, you know, approach zero. Mm -hmm. Um, and so then, you know, and then, and then you start to sort of intersect with company and business metrics, um, as it moves like through to the tech spec, maybe you're thinking about, you know, pieces A and B, like the, 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 the video permission needs to be granted by the browser. The audio, audio permission does too. The user, if they are confused, needs some like help text to walk them through it. Um, you know, and then eventually you drill down into like whatever JavaScript function talks to your browser and like asks for the prompt for the user. Um, so the, the, the life cycle of the project itself going from abstract to unit tests kind of pulls the acceptance criteria along in the, in the same way. Um, I feel like that was a, a more vague answer than I often have, but it was a, kind of a vague question. I mean, yes, <laughs> you're kind of at each step, you're breaking it down a layer, right? So you're totally. saying I'm mm -hmm. starting from, okay, high level. I want this business outcome. Uh, you know, your example, the user should be able to double check their video and um, audio before they join the chat. And then you say, okay, what does that imply? Well, there's a video piece, there's an audio piece. We've broken it down that far. Okay, what do you need for each one of those? What are the failure modes? And you're kind of generating these nested, I guess, checklists because you like checklists mm -hmm. um, <laughs> as you go further down. Yep. Yeah, every checklist is really just the leaves on a tree. Mm -hmm. So should we call them check trees? Yeah, I'm game for that. 
That works. Okay. Um, okay. The other thing that I wanted to dig into from this was this idea of decision documents and writing down the choices you didn't choose. What does that ideally look like? How do you approach, you know, what should go into this? Cause you could, you could go on forever, right? We didn't choose all these different things. So what is the right level of abstraction or how do you figure out the right level of abstraction for a decision document? Yep. Um, well, and that I'll, I'll go straight to back my, back to my heuristic of if I write this and close my eyes, um, will the, will an inappropriate thing happen? Um, and I'm under no illusions that, you know, if I, if I go on vacation and the team, uh, chugs along that, you know, they're going to find stuff that I didn't think of. They're going to find surprises that I didn't know about, like whatever. Um, so I, I don't expect it to be exactly as I set out. Uh, if I did, I would work at a company that has waterfall development. Um, but that sounds miserable. So I don't. Um, so it's, you know, like given, given whatever you know about your team and their understanding of the product and their, uh, you know, technical history and expertise, write something that they will understand, right? Know, know the audience, right? Um, and so like if I'm writing a proposal to clean up some tech debt that I need to get onto the roadmap, which means like it's going to go up against like product proposals too, that of course the company is often more interested in. I need to write this in such a way that the pain I feel becomes the pain the product manager feels, <laughs> right? Of like, our, like our users are suffering because this, or our development is slow because this or whatever. Um, so you know your audience and you describe the problem that way. If I'm writing a technical spec for a team that has been together for two years and is intimately familiar with every aspect of the code, um, then you can say simple things like, you know, A needs to change to B, and they will all know what that entails. Um, if you have a intern for the summer and you're trying to describe to them, you know, what to do as their, their first corporate position, um, then it's going to be very detailed and make no assumptions about the previous knowledge. Right, because they took their algorithms class and wrote a JavaScript application, and now suddenly they're thrown into, you know, who knows what, um, some million line legacy Ruby implementation. Um, so, you know, then you say, like, right up front, by the way, you're expected to talk to me about this as you go. <laughs> and you continue into, here's what's happening, here's the relevant code, we're going to walk through this code together. Um, but, like, here are the files you'll be interested in, right? Get very, very, very detailed, like, to, to a micromanager level, um, but just because otherwise you're going to be completely lost. Um, and as soon as they don't need that micromanagement at all, um, then like, great, yeah, right? Then you start leaving details out, letting them come to it themselves. People like that autonomy. People can often make better decisions with those details than you can write in the tech spec, which is why we don't do waterfall development. So one of the things you mentioned there that I like is you, in the case of an intern, you are essentially explicitly laying out some of your uh, interpersonal expectations as well as your technical expectations. Mm -hmm. You should be coming and talking to me at each one of these steps. Are there other examples of that that you find in working with some of the other groups you might work with, a well-established team or your product manager, where you're not only laying out, here's the technical details, but here's something about the meta agreement we're doing here? Um, yes, the two places I immediately think of that are milestones. Um, and by the way, an important part of tech specs, I think, that people often miss or don't think about is what order does this happen? Um, and those my, But those milestones become the agreement with the other stakeholders about what's going to happen on what, yeah, at least in one or, what order, um, if not when, because estimates. Um, but I, And I, I always like to particularly arrange those milestones so that uh, when we inevitably get distracted by something, um, or when this project ends up taking four times as long and we decide to bail out, um, are we left with something that we can still use, right? Like, have we at least made steps? We have a new part of our infrastructure. We have some new blocks we can use for the next thing. So I very much try to lay out my milestones in such a way that if we're interrupted, it's not just all for nothing, um, right? It's not just, just chucked out. Um, but I think the milestones in, in any kind of like document you're writing for the project become that agreement about like the general flow of things. Um, the other idea I have there is whenever, maybe sort of whenever somebody wants a status update, um, right or uh, whether they whether they know they want it and have asked you or whether you realize that they feel uncomfortable and just need to be like uh, I don't know, assuaged <laughs> um, is to, uh, to just to just be clear right like we we have 14 things to do eight of them are left um, given the current pace where we would guess this deadline if you're making us pick a deadline um, or uh, often I see this when 
when somebody comes and asks you something, maybe you're the tech lead or the, the DRI on a project, um, but you have a bunch of other people working on it, right? You have um, six other people or six other teams like kind of all coordinating. Uh, they might come to you because you're the point of contact, but you might not know. And so you just need to be uh, ask a very clear question to the person who does know. Um, of like, uh, or, or actually, it, it, it's probably a fan out to the the four people who actually know. Um, so, uh, hey, Kevin, you're the expert in this section. Um, what can you tell us about how far through we are? Hey, Jeff, you're the expert in this section. How's that going? Like, um, you know, like, and, and that's for a general status update, right? How much long will this be, et cetera? Um, or um, sometimes, uh, and actually, this is the second time I've had this thought, uh, so I'll say it out loud. Um, there's a lot of work that people don't like doing that doesn't actually take very long. It's just not very interesting, but doing it destroys ambiguity. Um, like, um, well, I'll just give you my current example. Uh, we're working through a bunch of API upgrades and some of those APIs have needed like span out to other tasks um, because they're not actually the one API. It takes in a keyword that's effectively a function call of like, okay, which of these 30 things are we actually gonna do in this API? Um, so it looks, it, it started out looking at in the initial tracker as one API upgrade. It is actually a set of 30 things, independent tasks to do. Um, and uh, I realized at some point that only 10 of these things were written down. So the thing that nobody really wants to do is find the other 20 and write them down. Um, but, or uh, in this context, uh, ask the person very clearly uh, who is responsible for that thing, where are these 20 things? In fact, not where are they, but please put these in the list. Right. Um, just be just be clear at every step of like mm -hmm. what 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 the necessary outcome is, what the acceptance criteria is, um, yeah. because acceptance criteria is happening all the time, not just in like what code gets written. It's in how the meta process is happening and this being tracked. So the acceptance criteria I have for you right now is all these 30 functions need to be in the spreadsheet, because even if you know you're about to do them by yourself, everybody else needs to know that they exist, because otherwise they think we're done and we're not. We have 20 left to do. I, there's some really interesting things to get, dig into here. So one is I'm starting to see a pattern in this conversation of you know, the process of engineering is the gradual destruction of ambiguity. Absolutely. <laughs> How do you, you know, and, and I think one of the things you're highlighting here is often it's not that much work, but it's not interesting. It's not exciting. It's not, uh, and it's not, accounted for mm -hmm. so do you have like a system you use to to like systematically evaluate how much ambiguity is remaining or where are the sources of ambiguity and and sort of dive through them or is it more ad hoc than that both um so the the system i have the checklists um if <laughs> if, if, if 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 there if a question exists a list is missing right um like like i i would i would happily put that on a t-shirt Right? If a question exists, a list is missing. Um, and I've seen this um, recently. I, I was just uh, giving somebody advice on like, there's the sort of end of the project, the almost end of the project, the, the transition from done to done done, where like everybody knows that the work is winding down, but nobody will say out loud, we're finished. And my question is, where's the list? If the list is empty and we're not done, what's missing from the list? If the list is not empty, but we feel done, do we still need those things on the list? And that's kind of it, right? Only one of those two things can be the case. Um, and then the work that nobody particularly wants to do and often is unaccounted for is make the list, um, right? Like just write it down because now everything has, everybody has one place to look to know when we are finished. And if ever there's a mismatch between the list and the feeling of being finished or the ability to click the like launch button, turn off the experiment, it's ready, um, then fix the list. Um, the other thing is a more general framework, and this is another thing uh, that I've uh, appropriated from my aphorisms guy. His name is Pow, by the way, P-A-W. Um, uh, he, uh, nobody likes deadlines. Nobody likes to pick a date, um, right? For whatever human reasons, um, uncertainty that you will hit it and the feeling of embarrassment if you fail, um, the idea that the date is being chosen by somebody else, but engineering has not yet had input and we don't know if we can do that, right? Like all kinds of things, whatever. The deadline doesn't matter. Um, usually, right, unless you have a contract with the government and your funding will be pulled if it's not June 1st, usually the deadline is fully under your control, um, or at least in many cases. Um, and, and I haven't worked at jobs that typically have like customers waiting on us, 
um, you have freelanced and contracted, so perhaps you have a different perspective by deadlines. Um, but uh, you, so you, you, the, the framework here is you don't start with a deadline. You start with a target date, right? Here's what you're shooting for, but everybody needs to be clear that that's a target date, that is not a deadline. Um, and it will move if it needs to move. The only reason it's not a deadline is there are things we don't know. We have some uncertainties or some ambiguities or whatever. That, by the way, is a checklist, is a list. <laughs> So you write up your tech spec, you make your uh, task, your, your tickets, you do whatever your process is. And then you say, okay, given this, and we've done our planning poker and we have a hundred things that are going to take three days each. So we need, uh, you know, we have 10 people. So that comes down to whatever the math is. Um, given that our target date is this, but here's our list of stuff we don't know. Some of it is stuff that we need to go prototype to discover like how this code works. Some of it is stuff that we need to talk to some stakeholders and decide. Some of it is user research that we need to do to see if anybody actually likes this approach, right? Like whatever the uncertainty is, that's on the list. And that's why this is not a deadline yet. It's a target. Now you have no ambiguity. The, the, the uncertainty is there, but it's clear what the uncertainty is. Um, and there will always be an item of like, shit we didn't think of. Everybody just needs to be okay with that, right? Um, you'll, you'll find them. Um, if you never find them, you didn't need them. Um, but now your stakeholders, who the, the people who want the deadline, right? Because um, so, and, and uh, this is a pal saying every target date deserves to grow up into a deadline, right? At some point you're supposed to launch this thing. It's going to happen on a date. If you can know that date beforehand, that's lovely, right? Because then you can talk to marketing and whoever and do your whole like go to market thing. Um, so every target date deserves to graduate into a deadline. The way it graduates is by eliminating your uncertainties. So any stakeholder is now fully within the rights to come to you and say, how is that list? And if the list is not getting smaller, you're not doing your job, right? And so the, the, the list itself is a set of tickets to do, a set of tasks to perform. of like, okay, I'm going to go prototype this. I'm going to figure out some things. That's going to turn into task tracker tickets. And now this uncertainty is gone. When there are no longer any uncertainties, you have a deadline. I love that. This feeds into something you sort of alluded to earlier, which is how every engineer hates estimates. <laughs> and I you know, had a conversation in an earlier one of these with someone representing the business side of the house about why estimates are still important and they totally. have a conversation. I'd be curious if I could get you to expand a little bit on how you think about estimates, estimation, and their role in the development process. Yep. Um, yes, it is true that everybody hates them and that they are important. Um, <clears throat> The, so I, um, one, of the, one of the things we noticed in my last company um, that I will credit uh, Rick for, um, in case anybody knows Rick. Um, you know, if, if you know a Rick, assume it was him. He's a smart guy. Um, it's, it's all, uh, a lot of the, the static that happens in estimates are in the confidence interval. Um, if somebody says, when will this be done? And you say, in 30 days then they are probably going to take that as a 100% confidence. But you probably didn't mean that. You probably meant 70, right? Um, depending who you're talking to and what the situation is. Um, and the problem is going from 70% to 100% confidence takes the estimate from 30 days to six months, right? Because who knows what is going to happen, especially if the lessons of uncertainty still exists. So the way um, the way we sort of started to describe this to people, you know, and especially that, like this happens all the time between engineering or business or executives or product, like whatever, because everybody has their own thing that they need to know and their own reason they need to know the date and their own need for how concrete a date that's going to be. Um, the way we started describing it to people is, okay, how long does it take you to come into work? Oh, you know, 15, 20 minutes. Great. What if there's an accident on the highway? Oh, it could be an hour. Great. Do you want the normal day 20 minute estimate or do you want the I will definitely be here in an hour estimate, right? And most people don't actually need that. If, if you said, hey, Christian, let's grab coffee. Um, when will you be there? And I say, by four o'clock, but you wanted three. Like I'm telling you the truth, it's just not useful. Um, so, so I can say by three and it'll probably be by three. And coffee is a relatively low stakes game. So if it's 310, everything's fine. Um, right? If we have been doing this project for 18 months and we put $6 million behind it and our company's success hinges on its outcome, well, then we need to be, you know, better than 70% confidence. Um, or well, actually my opinion there is we need to work, we need to continue working until it's done or the money runs out. Um, but you, you know, you might, you might need to make that an 80 or a 90% confidence interval. Um, everybody still needs to know that that is not hundred percent because the company is probably not willing to make that a three-year project, right? The ROI there is poor. Um, but getting everybody on the same page as far as 
the like how how likely this date really is, right? Probably in a month, worst case six weeks, right? Like that's kind of good. Um, is that, that's helpful? Like just have everybody admitting that there is uncertainty is good, and that is why the list of uncertainties exists, and why you don't have a deadline until it's empty. Yeah, I like that. The other thing that I think is interesting there is, uh, you know, when you have, so as, as you highlight, right? Like oftentimes you just need the the ballpark, and sometimes that ballpark shows that there are wide mismatches in our assumptions, mm -hmm. right? So. Coffee is not a, a great example for this. Um, but say you you have this like company making or breaking project, and you say, okay, you know, to get to a ninety percent confidence interval of what we have said this project consists of, that's going to be six months. And the CEO says, well, the money runs out in three. Now you have highlighted a problem, <laughs> really, <laughs> and the solution there isn't to change your estimates. The solution mm -hmm. is to have a conversation about what is the scope of what actually has to get done in that three months that is our deadline. <laughs> yes, yes. What do we need first? Um, and actually, and actually, that that's a thing that often gets missed. Pe people think in binaries, um, and things are not. Um, not even in a database. Every time you make a boolean in a database, six months later you regret it because you need to know, right? You did. Does can does the user say we can email them, or can we not email them, or have we not asked yet? Every boolean has three values. <laughs> And it only gets worse from there. Um, in fact, every Boolean should probably be an enumerated thing um, of like, uh, you know, unknown, can email, can't email, because we're going to discover a fourth thing later. Um, so yes, like the, the question there is, well, what do we need first, right? What is, um, what can we do in six months that will be good enough that the business can buy, or sorry, what can we do in three months? I don't know if I said three or six. That's good enough that we can buy three more months to do the rest of it, right? Um, and so the, the, um, the binary is... The, the, the actual thing is not the binary of do we do this or not do this. It's when we when do we do this, right? We need prioritization. Um, like, oh well, we you know we we can't have any of this until users can log in. So let's let them log in. Okay, great. Now that they're here, there's nothing for them to do. What's the first thing they need to do? Well, they need to connect their bank account, right? Because like for whatever we're building, or so we can get money. Um, we'll figure out the future later. Just give us your bank account now. Um, and. This is great too, like mid project when somebody comes with a new feature for you, which is going to happen, and it's probably a great idea. Um, and the question is, is not, is not, uh, I'll do that or I won't do that. It's okay. Where does it go on the list? Right? I was going to do these five things. You want a sixth thing? Where does it go at the end? Should it replace number two? Like I'm fine with whatever. Just tell me what you need. Um, and so yeah, it's never, it's never. We're going to do this or not going to do this. We're going to succeed or not succeed. It's what do we do first? And you know how likely are we to succeed from there? <laughs> yes, I love that. And the the prioritization function is interesting, right? Because if you have a single project owner, it becomes straightforward to say, okay, mm -hmm. you're the project owner, put it in my list. But if you have multiple stakeholders with different agendas, <laughs> mm -hmm. you end up in a very different scenario. How do you approach that type of uh, challenge? Probably cage match. <laughs> 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 um, but like, because you know, like these multiple stakeholders should be speaking with one another, um, and so you get everybody in a room, and you like everybody needs to agree on the outcome, the acceptance criteria, right? What is what is this project succeeding mean? Um, given that, it's easier to put your ego aside about your particular thing or your particular need, and talk about what the project needs, um, right? And like you know, and you, you see this up in government, like. Like, I don't care what party you ascribe to. I don't care, like, how old you are or, like, whatever thing is going on or how much you hate the person on the other side of the aisle. Like, let's have a functioning economy, right? Let's, like, let's start by going from the zero to one of the country still exists and works, and let's figure out more details later. Um, this is topical. We're recording on May 25th. We'll see what happens to the debt ceiling. I was going to say, uh, by the time <laughs> this airs, we'll have an answer. Were they able to do that or not? Yep. So yeah, uh, now the 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 jury ticket is in your court Congress, um, but yeah, so you, you get all the you people have together. Chris John's you acceptance criteria. <laughs> yeah, C continue having a country. That's step one. Um, we can we can iterate from there. Because um, again, un unless this is a uh, a waterfall company, right? And uh, if if you if you were working at NASA and you were putting a human on Mars, take more time, <laughs> right? <laughs> like that's a different kind of project. Um, and I will accept a 12 year horizon and a waterfall process. That's perfect for that kind of thing. Um, you're still going to want a checklist for the, for the ship launch. Um, 
but if this is a small to medium to large tech company, um, right, and one that can deploy relatively quickly on the order of hours, ideally, um, but you know, days, minutes, quarters, months, whatever. If you can deploy with relative frequency, um, you're not shipping a thing to a human that is never going to be editable by you again. Then start with the basic thing, right? The user needs to do X, let them do X. The fact that you've now gone from it can't happen to it can happen is just step one, right? And then the question is just how much better can we make it happen? Um, so you get all the stakeholders together, you find out like, you know, what for, for the good of this project, what is the uh, first thing that needs to happen? How do we make this project exist at all? Given that, how do we start optimizing and what's more, most important to optimize first, right? Top of funnel, bottom of funnel, should we throw marketing dollars at it? Should we rely on word of mouth? Like whatever kind of thing. Um, and for anything that gets deprioritized, is there some way we can cheat to make it not hurt as, hurt as much until we get to it, right? Like, hey, maybe we don't have the million dollars yet for the big marketing like advertisement thing, but maybe we can just start tweeting like mad, um, right? Or, you know, everybody loves that, uh, that uh, you tweet about my product button. I don't know how many people click it. I don't think I ever have. Um, but like, you know, how, how, can we, how can we get a good ROI there? Where's the inflection point? Um, on the amount of effort we have to put in, how quickly we can do it, and what the outcome is going to be from it, um, and maybe for the stuff you know low down on the list, we can cheat until we get there for real. Cheating is great, by the way. We should always cheat. Say more. Um, everything's hard. Everything's hard if you really want to do it. So don't cheat. I'm trying to think of an example so I don't just sound flippant, um, but I think this is fair to be flippant about. I think to some extent it comes back to what you were talking about in terms of outcome focus, right? What is the yeah. outcome we're trying to get to and what is the minimum possible thing we can do that would achieve that outcome? It's almost certainly mm -hmm. less than build the whole roadmap. Yeah. Yeah. Here's what, what's the, uh, what's the stupidest thing that could possibly work. Yeah. Um, I, I thought of a way to cheat. Um, th this is actually an old, old story from college um, where uh, one of the projects was Boggle. Right, the game where you have a four by four grid of letters, you have to make words. Um, the point of the assignment was to teach students how to like build a dictionary, build a tree, um, or a, a try in fact, because it's a 26 area like word and letter traversal, um, which is great, except that gets big when you use a full dictionary. And there are a bunch of cool ways that you can like do prefix and suffix and su suffix collapsing to shrink the dictionary. Um, but now it's not editable anymore, right? There's a trade off there. Whenever you opt optimize, you lose flexibility. Um, so, uh, the professor, um, she was building the, uh, the dictionary for the students to use. And she had done all this cool collapsing so that the, the, the dictionary, instead of being 45 megs was like 200 K. Um, like it's really quite a dramatic thing because it turns out there are only 26 letters and so many combinations. Um, but now the students couldn't use the dictionary as the list of words that had been found, which like you totally should. Because it turns out a dictionary is a list of words. And so, you know, here's your dictionary of real words, and here's a dictionary of stuff you've, you've found. But because this, uh, tree, this try collapse had happened, you couldn't edit it anymore. So like, oh, what am I going to do? Oh, well, when you add something to a dictionary, you put in a linked list. The, the student doesn't know, right? You have this layer of abstraction, right? And that's true everywhere. Your product is a layer of abstraction between your user and your server. Um, so if you're trying to do something that the user wants or will get benefit from, but it's really, really, really difficult, make the linked list, like cheat. Um, they're not going to know. They don't care. Um, and it's not going to matter until it matters, right? If you have 10 users, nobody's going to hit the performance bottleneck. When you have a million users, cool. You have the resources to solve the performance bottleneck. One of the things that you mentioned there was about trade-offs and, you know, you're trading off. Anytime you optimize, you lose flexibility. I think there's probably a few core. I mean, if there's anything that is core to engineering, like the the like heart of engineering is everything is a trade off. There's always mm -hmm. trade offs. There's no magic rainbow solution. I'm curious if there are other uh, recurring trade offs that have come up for you that you notice showing up over and over again in work. Hmm. Probably the most prevalent one is. Um, is, is, is the software de design process, right? How, how modular or um, the, the maintainability problem, right? Like how, how much will I be able to change this again later, um, not knowing what the future is going to entail? Um, and in my mind, that comes down to having extremely small functions and classes and things that do very specific stuff 
right? Very Unix philosophy. Do the one thing, do exactly that thing, um, and then test the hell out of it, <laughs> right? If if you have if you have a complete case analysis in your unit test, to some extent, I stop caring what your code looks like because you've proved that it works. Um, but then you know have good code too, and that takes longer. And you're on a timeline, and you have your target date graduating to a deadline, and the business only has three months of money. Um, so you always have to you know walk the line. Um, but I I have I have never regretted making something modular or general or maintainable. I have always regretted not every single time. Um, so I, I think that's the big one. Um, the, the rule of thumb that I like there, um, I forget where I heard it, um, but I try to attribute people where I can, um, is uh, assume the code you write is going to exist as long as your code base has existed. Right? If you started this country, this this uh, company a week ago, write code that will last a week. It doesn't matter. You don't know what you're doing yet. Um, if your company has lasted a year, like, okay, you know, write something that should last another year. If you're 10 years in, like, you got to write for the 10 year case because now you have customers and you built a platform and their developers are relying on you for their businesses and like, who knows what. Um, so I, I like that rule of thumb. Assume it'll, it'll exist as long as it's existed so far, um, which means I'm going to die at 78. <laughs> right? Not a crazy estimate. <laughs> Not so bad. Doesn't work as well for like my parents or my dad, right? He's sure. turned 80 recently. <laughs> I don't think he's going to make it to 160, unfortunately. True. Although um, I, I saw a recent study where the fall off is less dramatic than you might expect. Like you kind of, there, yeah, the sort older of this... you get, the more, the older you're likely to get. Right. And, and like it flattens us at some point where like at some point your chance of living another five years is just always 20%. Um, you know, and then we get the people up at 130, I think is the record, 131. Yeah, it's wild. Okay. Um, one of the things that we have talked about before that stood out in my mind that I always wanted to ask you about is um, you said at some point that you believe there are really only four pro core problems in the world, or I don't remember if it was the world or in like technology or something, and that we keep solving them over and over again in different ways. <laughs> um, and I, I don't know if you remember, but like, can you elucidate like what are those four problems or at least what are some of those problems? <laughs> I don't remember at all. Um, yeah, not, I, I don't even remember what we were talking about at the time. Okay. I don't, I don't remember if we were talking about code or people or what. The, the, first, the first problem that comes to mind is like, everything's always a CSV file. Like the internet is nothing but people sending CSV files back and forth. And you can spend three years building a pretty UI and then you put it in front of like a company administrator that needs to uh, incorporate it into their business process. And the first thing they want is a CSV export of like what's here. Because as soon as something doesn't fit on a page, like nobody's going to scroll, right? Or as soon as you need to edit more than one thing at a time, like you can start with the, you know, the check boxes and the bulk of the, the, the bulk change, but eventually somebody wants to put it in a CSV, edit it in whatever their spreadsheet software is, and then re-upload it to you and expect you to do the right thing. Um, so I, I, I subscribe a bit to CSV-driven development, um, but I don't know what the other three things were. Maybe asynchronous queuing. <laughs> All right. Um... We're also, I realize, shockingly, already getting close to the end of our hour. Are there things that we haven't talked about that you want to make sure that we cover? Ooh. Um, ambiguity is the one I kind of came in with. I feel like there's something else I was thinking about this morning that I have forgotten. Nothing comes to mind. I'm kind of thinking through recent conversations I've had. Um, but most of them come around to how easy it is to give advice and how hard it is to follow it or do it yourself. All right. Let's um, talk about that. Advice. Is giving it, advice. <laughs> giving advice. Well, is advice useful? What makes it useful? Or how do you derive value from it? Ooh, I have no idea. Um, well, because like, so actually, okay, I have a little bit of an idea. Um the advice that I give is stuff that works for me. And obviously, I'm only one of me. And you are a different you, um, right? And you, you and I are both middle-class white guys. But people have drastically different experiences than that, right? So my advice for you is likely to be more helpful because you match my experience than my advice for somebody else, um, right? Who you know, grew up in a poor part of town or is an underrepresented in tech or like all kinds of stuff, um, right? Has to put up with microaggressions all the time. Um, Actually, and, and this has now reminded me of a topic that I was thinking about earlier. Um, like every, the 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 advice might be good advice that's not useful to the person. Um, 
So it needs to be important that when you give somebody advice, you don't actually expect them to listen to it. Right? It's, it's information for them. Um, right? Here's an approach. It has worked for me. Um, sometimes I give advice about approaches that haven't worked for me, but I feel like they should have, or I've seen other people do the well or whatever. Um, but it's up to the person to ultimately like choose what they do with that advice and, or how they, how they take part of it and incorporate the rest of it into like something that does work better for them. Um, like it's not a, again, it's not a binary, right? There's this whole like direction it can, like varying directions it can go in. Um, but one place where I get, um, I talk a lot with people about is like, how well pe people ask a lot how do i get to the next level of like you know my career um and i think that I, that's typically easier down at the the junior levels of like okay well you know do this get good at writing tickets get good at writing text specs get good at actually doing the code get good at thinking through the test cases but you know get you you go from the how to the what to the why and it gets very confusing um and very ambiguous of like what do i even do more or differently before i am like labeled the next thing and get the raise that comes with it um but a lot of it, especially toward the junior levels, my advice, which may or may not be any good for all the experiential reasons that people have, is, well, ju well just do something. Just do stuff, right? You're like, what, what, like, <laughs> and I know that that starts by sounding silly, but um, whether it is how do I take more control of a project, how do I show that I'm in control of a project, how do I show I'm doing stuff, or how do I not need to ask so many people for things, like, just do something. Just make a decision. Um, no, nobody's going to be mad, right? Nobody's going to, no, nobody, nothing's going to go totally wrong before you can correct it, um, right? So uh, like you can start with like the more small, comfortable decisions. Oh, what should this sentence on the page say? Or, um, you know, should this be a Boolean or an enum? Like those are like things within the scope of, of, of a, a new engineer. And then move up to other decisions about um, like the things that go into the text bag, the things that go into the architecture, but do them. Because if you don't do them, you're not going to learn anything. And if you do something, you can learn something. And that's the whole point, right? So the, the whole idea of like biasing towards action. Um, so that's a lot of the advice that I give. Um, but especially people who have like, who, who are underrepresented and uh, have, you know, humans have varying reasons and degrees of insecurity. They don't like doing that. They don't, you, you don't, nobody likes to fail or feel like they screwed up or be told no. Um, and I, as a person who has never had trouble like writing shit into a public channel um, from, you know, from actual technical stuff to stupid jokes. Um, I have no problem like with that. I don't mind screwing up. Um, and I'm sure there's an entire set of therapy sessions that we could go through of like, why? And I recognize that other people are not going to be in that situation and they are not going to feel comfortable making that decision or talking about it in public or whatever. Um, so, you know, then like they and you and whoever is involved needs to like work for the way that they can take those actions in the way that works for them. Um, uh, I think there's something interesting there, right? So like the tech, the tactic that you use works for you as someone who is generally safe to screw up in those environments, mm -hmm. right? Like as you highlight, you know, middle-class white dude in tech, like there's not that many consequences that are likely to come down from the scope of mistake we're talking about here. And you can so, make a fool of yourself in public or in a Slack channel. And there may be some judgment, but it's, pretty small compared to what an underrepresented minority might see. Yeah. But I think there there's a piece of what you were talking about that that brought me back to our earlier conversation. The examples you gave, making a decision on this, making a decision on this, what you're doing is you are moving up the ambiguity tree mm -hmm. and you are destroying greater and greater levels of ambiguity. You are mm -hmm. moving towards clarity and not requiring someone else to do that. And so whatever mechanism the, the, the approach that you use to do that may need to vary based on your environment, based on you, based on all these other things. But the goal is to move from this place where everyone's destroying the ambiguity for you and you're doing execution work to where you are the one who's helping to create clarity from ambiguity. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, again, here's another false dichotomy. You don't have to either ask for the decision or make the decision. The middle ground there is, I'm going to do this. Let me know if that's a problem. Right, so you're not just like laying down the law, and suddenly you know this this tremendously confident person who knows everything, um, and, and you're in, still involved with the other people who might have made a different decision, right, or or at least have a have skin in the game. Um, so yeah, there's always this like full spectrum to walk of like I need to ask how this should be done. I'm going to say how this should be done, or I'm going to recommend how this should be done. Right, I'm going to try this, and if somebody disagrees, I, I'll change the code. 
Um, and the the more and more you get like down the experience ladder, the more often you'll be like more or less correct and and not need to change something. And then you also it's not a binary whether this happens like uh, in public or not. You can go DM somebody, right? You can quietly talk to three different people and make sure they all think it's a relatively good idea, and then post in public, hey, I talked to X, Y, and Z, right? And that can help some of the like insecurity um, or some of the uh, like need to uh, to verify the idea before you like kind of put your name on it. Well, and it it keeps going up the ladder, right? So an example you had earlier was you're not the decision. You have multiple stakeholders. They are the decision makers. You can't unilaterally make the prioritization decision, but mm -hmm. you can get them all in a room. You can yep. shepherd the decision. So you not only do you are there middle grounds or, or gradations on the level of decision making you're doing, there's more flexibility in terms of even if you're not the decision maker, how do you make sure the decision happens in a timely way? Yes, and that now touches back on biasing towards action and doing the things nobody really feels like doing. The the action to take is put all the people in a room, right? The action doesn't have to be commit code or don't commit code. The action can be, oh, I need Kevin and I need Jeff. Kevin and Jeff, we're having a meeting. I've set it up tomorrow. See you then. Um, and then, yeah, that's already a decision you've made. And then, you know, Jeff says, oh, I'm sorry, I can't. I have a dentist appointment that I forgot to put on my calendar. No problem. We'll move the meeting, <laughs> right? Um, but... The, there is such a loss of productivity in the cycle of asking, hey, Kevin and Jeff, do you think we should meet about this? And I'm going to, what, wait for three hours while both of you respond and like we get the unanimous consent? Or like, hey, what time are you guys free tomorrow? Or like like any of that. Hey, I made it one o'clock. If that's a problem, let me know. <laughs> we'll make it a different o'clock. Um, so you can, like, uh, uh, eliminating all those loops uh, can, can speed things up quite a bit. Absolutely. Yeah, if you're in an office, hey, come with me now. We're walking over to their desk. <laughs> Yep. Let's go. <laughs> Kevin, do you have a second? Yeah, and then there's all things. Oh, we know he's got his headphones on. Leave him alone, right? <laughs> there's the, uh, uh, I want to say it was a guy named Glebe who I used to work with. Like, if you walk over to somebody with a question, um, but, like while they have their headphones on, their heads down, whatever their like work mode is, you are asserting that the thing in your head is more, more important than the thing in their head. Um, that's quite an assertion. You don't know what's going on in there, right? Like, send, send, them, send them a text message first <laughs> over whatever your text channel is. All right, that's it for this human skills interview. If you enjoyed it, please consider liking this video and subscribing to this channel. You can also subscribe to the human skills newsletter, which there's a link to right down below to get notified of interviews like this as they come out. Take care y'all. This is K-Ball signing out.